everyone, and welcome to the Chapel's live feed. This is our Wednesday night service, and although it's a little bit different than we normally have on Wednesday nights, the presence of God is still in this place. Um, I was thinking about how awkward it was for pastors all over America right now that are preaching to literally empty pews, and that's something different for all of us. We've never went through this circumstance before. But I, I laughed because I was thinking about when I was growing up and my dad pastored a church in Rossville, Georgia. And I was in first and second, third grade at that time. And every single Sunday we would come home and he would give me the Sunday school material and he would line my baby dolls up for me to preach to them. So tonight I have a lot of empty pews and then our staff is here. So I welcome you. I ask you to go ahead and take the time to share this. Start a watch party. Tag your friends in it. Uh, anyone that needs an encouraging word, I know that I have a word directly from God that's going to offer encouragement during this time. So go ahead and take the time to share that. Tag your friends. Start your watch party, whatever you want to do. And for the next few minutes, I want you to give me your attention because I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God has given me something special to give to you tonight. Friday night... After Pastor Donnie and I went to bed, it was probably about 3 o'clock in the morning, and the Lord woke me up. And I knew it was the Lord because I could feel his presence with me there in the room. And I began to pray. We've all probably had a lot of restless nights recently. A lot of us haven't slept the best in the world. We're trying to figure things out. We're, we're asking a lot of questions. We're, we're talking to God. Hopefully we're talking to God. Or we're just trying to figure it out for ourselves. So as I lay there and I, I realized that I was praying to God and I began to ask God, God, what is it that you're speaking to me? You woke me up for a reason. And he gave me a specific word. When God spoke to me, he gave me an encouraging word to give his people. And so tonight I want to give you two points that I felt like God gave me during the night on Friday night. They actually go hand in hand. What I felt that the Lord spoke to me is this, that my people are asking the question, what now? What now? The virus has been here. The, the circumstance is here. We're dealing with whatever you're dealing with. Perhaps it's in your jobs or your families or whatever circumstance personally that you're dealing with. We as, as the world and as a nation are faced with something that we've never been faced with before. So God said, my people are asking the question, what do I do now? What do I do? Because now looks different than two months ago did. Now looks different than a year ago perhaps looked to you. We're all walking through this storm that we've never walked through before. We have never experienced, personally, I have never experienced a storm quite like this. No doubt we all want to do the right thing. I see that all over Facebook. Do the right thing. But the thing is, what is the right thing? Do we really know what the right thing is? Because the right thing to one person may differ to someone else. So that depends on who you ask as to what is the right thing. You can get differing information depending on what source you go to for your information. You can go to one news channel and get one report, switch over to another one, and they're saying something different. The statistics will be different. The cure, the what all's going on in America, everything is different depending on what source you go to. If you look on Facebook, you can pull up anything to support whatever you want to support at the particular time. So you get different information. So at the least, it becomes very frustrating. It leaves us in a sense of panic asking the question, what do I do now? What do I do with the circumstance that has been dealt to me right now? So let me pause right here long enough to tell you that regardless of your circumstance, regardless of where you're at right now, regardless if you're still clocking in somewhere, or regardless if you have been stripped away from your job and you don't know where your next meal is coming from, worrying will not change a thing. Going to bed tonight and tossing and turning and trying to figure out what you're going to do about the situation will not change a thing. The sun will still come up in the morning and the problem will still be there and the question will be, what do I do now? Anxiety doesn't change what you're going through. The Word of God tells us, in fact, to be anxious for nothing. Yet some are experiencing that 
The what ifs. We all know about the what ifs. What am I going to do if I lose my job? What am I going to do if the unemployment doesn't come through? What am I going to do if, if my children are not able to go back to school and I've got to uh, have them in a place so that I can go to work? What am I going to do? And so what happens through that is without even realizing it, especially right now, we find ourselves in a cycle where all of our time and our thoughts and our energy is consumed with the circumstance. So I want you to pause just a moment to ask yourself the question, what's the first thing I thought of when I got out of bed this morning? See, for, for me, it's always been for the last uh, you know year or two, I have made it a practice that when I get out of bed, I make my bed. I do that daily discipline because I want to be faithful in the small things. That's just something God has spoke to me. But what is the first thing I think of? Do I reach for my phone and check Facebook to see if, if perhaps, you know, what's new today? How many has died since last night? Have they found uh, the, the, the right antidote of medication? Has someone else experienced this that perhaps I know, know or don't know? We get up in the morning checking the latest news, looking at social media to see if anything new happened overnight. And we totally have consumed our minds and our thoughts with the circumstance. It may not even be the, the coronavirus that's going around. It may be a different circumstance for you. Whatever your circumstance is, we have found ourselves in a place that the, the consumption of that circumstance has become a lifestyle for so many. So when God woke me up and began speaking into my spirit, I began to clear my mind and I said, God, right now I lay aside everything. I lay aside every thought I've got, every... Uh, apprehension, God, I just want to have a clear mind before you for you to speak to me. I want to listen intently so that I can hear the voice of God. You know the voice of God. You have been through problems before. It's just that this problem is in chartered territory that we've never seen before. We've never went through something like this. And so all of a sudden we think this is greater than anything. Can I pause long enough to tell you that in the, the mind of God, in the atmosphere of the presence of the Lord, there is no such thing as one storm being greater than the other. A storm is a storm and that absolutely nothing is impossible with God. So I ask God, God, what, what is it exactly that you want me to give your people? And he said, number one, I want you to tell them to seek me, to seek God. Here we have taken, uh, or have we taken any time to ask God during this time for direction? You see, we've sought out other means of perhaps employment, and we've sought out things that were, we've cried many tears, we, we've pulled our family units together, we've went and picked up toilet paper until there's no more toilet paper to be picked up, we bought out all the chicken, we bought out all the roast and all the potato, all of those things, the shelves are clear. But have we taken the time to seek God? I want you to ask yourself that question. God, what are you trying to speak to me in the midst of what we're going through? What is it that you're trying to teach me? Because, see, it doesn't matter whether some people say, you know, this is God's judgment. And others say this is from the devil. That doesn't matter because in every circumstance that you face, there is a lesson to be learned. There is a teaching to be done. And if we remain with a teachable spirit, then we can go before the presence of the Lord, seeking his face and saying, God, what is it you're trying to teach me? What is it that you're saying to me? Have we been so consumed with doing that we've missed the opportunity to seek him? You know, we've all said, this is a new time for us. We, you know, the, the doors of the church are not closed because we are the church. And that's true. And a lot of us have been doing for the Lord. But can I tell you that just doing alone without seeking his direction gets us nowhere? We can be busy doing and miss the visitation of God. Seek God. Seek God. Matthew 6 and 33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, the place of right standing with Him. And when you seek me, you seek the, that place of right standing, then all of the things that you have need of will be added unto you. But first, we have to seek. See, we're worried about seeking the things. 
Have we taken the time to get before our face? We've all been stuck inside the house, but have we found ourselves on our floor, on the on our face before God, saying, God, this is this is something I don't know what to do with. This is a, an area of my life I have no idea how to handle. God, you direct me. Second Chronicles 7 and 14, a very popular scripture right now. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and I will hear, heal their land. When? When you seek his face. So when God spoke to me, he said, tell the people to seek me. I have direction. I have a certain order that I want this thing to go in. But if you don't seek me, you don't seek me with all your heart, then you're not listening then you're not hearing the direction of the Lord. You are going aimlessly and trying to figure out these things on their own. Seek my face. God, what is it that you want from me during this time? During this time that, that I, whether you're quarantined or you're social distancing or whatever how you are labeling it, whatever, during this time, God, what is it? That you're speaking to me. Because here's the thing. God wants us to change us to be more like him. But the change has to start in me. The change has to start in you. Each individual person has to go before the Lord. That's why we always say we hate religion. We don't like religion, especially here at the chapel. We're all about advocating and condoning a lifestyle of a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, which means I have a personal relationship with him. I have a personal time that I can go before the presence of the Lord and I can say, God, it's me. It's me and all of my mis uh, my, all of my failures, all of the things that I don't do right. It's just me, God. And now I'm in the need. I'm in a need. I need to, to hear from you. I need direction from you. So seek my face. That's what he said. Then I want to take you to what is my text scripture in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. The word of God says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. So number one, we have to seek him. We have to seek his face. We have to seek his direction. And once the revelation of direction, once he has, has outlined to you personally the, the direction that you're going for in your life, the word of God says, I, have, I know the plans I have for you. Those plans haven't changed. I know the plans I have for you. And this is just a process as part of your plan. But if we don't seek God and seek Him for direction, we will miss the process in which we are going. So once we have sought the face of God and the direction has been given, number two, He said, tell my people to trust. To trust. Once God has given us the direction, once he has revealed his plan and his direction, you must trust that revelation. You can't go back to God and say, hey, can we negotiate this thing? You know, that, that was something I was famous to do with God. I could go to God and say, hey, man, it's me. It's me, and, you know, I, I, I've got this situation got going on, and God gives me direction, and I say, okay, I like half of that, God. But the other half I'm not too sure about. Can we negotiate this thing? Can we talk about this thing? Can we revisit this thing and perhaps make it a little bit more comfortable for me? But we are living in a time that God says to trust me. Trust me in everything. I, nothing is impossible with God. We have to place our whole trust in in him. So this is where the rubber meets the road. You can seek God for direction. And if you don't do anything with the direction that he gives you, there was no sense in you seeking God. Uh, is that biblical? Well, the Bible says faith without works is dead. So you can have all the faith that you want to have. He can give you all the direction he wants to give you. But if you, once that revelation has been given, do not trust him enough to follow through and put legwork to what he has given you, then it doesn't mean anything. So I like to say it's where the rubber meets the road. This is where our character is revealed. This is where we begin to be a witness 
to those around us. You see, when we sold our house in Conyers and we moved here because God spoke into Pastor and I's heart that sell your house there. Beautiful home. It was a great place to live. But God said, move to Clayton County. And I'm like, really, God? Because, you know, I graduated from there in 1984. And, you know, I'm not sure about that. And God said, if you can't live in the county, in the community of the people you're trying to reach, don't try to reach them. I'm going to say that again because that was pretty good. If you can't reside and live in the county, in the community of the people, if you are too good to be part of the community where I have sent you to minister, then I'm going to send somebody else. I don't want God sending nobody else. I want him to use me. This is my calling. This is pastor's calling. This is the place that he has put us, us here. And so when we moved to this area, we agreed that we'd buy groceries in the, in the community where we pastor. We'd, I'd get my nails done. He ain't going to get his nails done at no nail place. That just ain't going to happen. I'd get my nails done. We'd get our hair done. We'd, we would visit the restaurants. We would pour our finances into the small businesses here in the community. And God has honored that. And he has blessed that. Because now they know our character. But you see, right now, in the time that we're living in, our characters will be seen. Do we really believe what we have preached to you every single Sunday for the last three years? Do we really believe what we have come by your family's bedside and we have knelt down when you had a family member that was going through a crisis and we have said, trust God. Believe in God. Nothing is impossible with God. Put it at the feet of Jesus and, and leave it knowing he's got it under control. So what would it be like now if I didn't display that? My character is shown in my response to the circumstance. So we have to become a witness to those around us. People may call you crazy. They may say, how are you still so happy and all of this this stuff going on. How do you still go to bed at night and, and you can sleep through? How in the world are, are you not worried about what, what is going on? I won't lie to you today and tell you that I haven't been concerned. We have been concerned. But when that thought begins to invade my mind, I take into captivity that very thought because that is the thing that will cause us to make us or break us. It's what we allow our minds to to go to. So trust in God. Ministry comes from how others see how you respond during a time of crisis. Ask yourself, what has been my response? Have I trusted God? Have I lived what I have proclaimed day after day? When things are going good, it's easy to preach faith. When things are going good and the bills are paid, I can get up here and say, Jehovah Jireh, he's my provider because everything is going good. But when, the, when it is hard and I don't know where my next meal is coming from and I'm not sure where I'm gonna, how I'm going to make that next house payment, then that's when we are looked at and people are saying, okay, now do you still have that faith that you told me to have. So ministry comes when others see how you respond during a time of crisis. Our scripture says to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. Why is that? Because we've, you've always heard me teach you. If you've ever been in my Bible studies, the one thing I can say is knowledge is, and you will answer, power. Because you know that I have drove that home. But of course, knowledge is power. But even at its best, at this time, our knowledge is skewed. We really don't have the knowledge. No one has the answer. No one knows. If, you know, we, go, we listen to the briefings every single day, and, and we pray that they have something good to tell us. But at this point, no one really has the answer. No one knows. Our understanding is so limited, and it's based on limited knowledge that we have. Everything that we see or read or, or hear right now differs from one channel to another. So the question is, what do you believe? What is really the truth to you? Because that's what it boils down to. What do I believe? I want to tell you that we live in a society right now that there is no such thing as an absolute truth. Let me explain what I mean about that because 
I feel that we're raising future generations to adopt the policy that there is no absolute truth. So explain that to me. I'm glad you asked because I'm going to. We, we have a generation or we're raising a generation that has adopted the philosophy that if it feels good, do it. If I choose to worship the God of the universe, that's my God. And that becomes truth to them. And we are told, don't, don't, uh, don't question that truth because that's truth to them. You believe in your truth over there and I'll believe in my truth over here. But here's the thing. There is only one true God. And so when we adopt that philosophy that there is no absolute truth, then what we are doing is we are inviting spirits into our area, into our atmosphere where we are at. If, if it is what I believe, this is what is said, then that becomes the truth. If I believe abortion should be okay, then that's the truth for me. So I don't need to knock that. And if you believe abortion is wrong, then that's the truth for you. But can I tell you there is only one truth, and that's what comes from the pages of this word. The word of God is truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father except by me. So who is the truth? What lies between the pages of this this Bible. What is the truth? Jesus is the truth. So there is an absolute truth. So I ask you tonight, do you believe that? What is it that you believe? That's where the thought of everyone worships their own God in their own way comes from. The higher power that we hear so much about in some of the outside societies I absolutely hate to hear, and this is just my pet peeve, by the way, but I hate to hear someone say, well, the man upstairs, can I tell you for a moment that there is no such thing as the man upstairs? First of all, God is a spirit. He is not a man, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And when we adopt that philosophy that he's just the man upstairs, then we make him equal just in a different location. He is not just the man upstairs. So if you're ever around me, just don't say it. and We don't have to argue about it. Because this is the truth. The God I serve, the God of this Bible that I have here tonight, is simply not a man upstairs. He is the great I am. This word is the absolute truth. God's word is truth. The word of God says don't lean or believe what your understanding of the situation is. Trust what the truth of God's word says. No, that's why it's so important that you eat this, that you breathe this, that everything, you can't be so holy as people would say. Well, you're, I, guess, I don't want to be around you because all you talk about is God. Okay, just don't be around me because that's my life. He is my life. And I want to eat this word and breathe this word so that the words that come out of my mouth glorify him. So his word is truth. Don't lean or believe what your understanding is. Because your understanding is only in the flesh. It, it, it is at best what you can capture and you can bring in an understanding. So I want to ask you this. This question. What does truth look like? Because I keep talking about, or what does trust look like? I'm sorry. What does trust? Because first we're to seek God. And then we're to trust God. What he speaks to us. We're to trust him in all things. But what does trust look like? Well, let me explain it like this. Because I believe that trust can look differently to different people. You see, not everyone has been church their whole life. Sometimes that's a bad thing. Honest to God, I, I was raised in church. I was dedicated at five days old. And sometimes I look back and I'm almost jealous of the testimony of someone that has been out in the world and has changed their life so drastically. Why, why is that? It's because sometimes some of us, and I'll, I'll blame it on us, some of us that have been raised in that religious atmosphere are going to want to be judgmental. We want to figure out, we think we've got it all taken care of. We know the way. Just follow us. We know how to do it. But then you've got someone that comes in that's just strung out on meth. And they come in and they give their heart to the Lord. And all they know is day and night is to read the Word of God. All they know day and night is to get on their face before God. And it's not the proper eloquent prayer that is given. It is just a prayer from the heart that says, God, 
I, I don't know how to do this. I don't even know if I'm doing it right. But God, I just want you to be king of my life. Lord, I just want you to lead me. So trust to me and my, my idea of trust may look very different than it is to that person. Because we're at different places in our life. So I want to give you a, just a couple of examples of what the word of God says and how trust looked to different people in the Bible. What did trust look like to Abraham? A lot of us, and, and a lot of you on live feed tonight, you've been to church, a lot of you I'm sure attend here at the chapel, and you know the story of Abraham in Genesis, the 22nd chapter, where God said to Abraham, get up and go to Moriah and offer up your son, your promised seed, your special son, your favorite son, go and offer him up as a burnt offering to me. So the direction has been given, right? That was our first point tonight. The direction has been given. Now, it's a question of whether Abraham's going to trust God or not. Is he going to trust God or is he going to argue with God? Is he going to try to negotiate because now God would never speak to me to do something like that. God would never speak to me and tell me to offer up something that I love so dearly. God would never ask me to make that sound. Abraham never said that. Can I tell you that his idea of trust was a wholehearted, God, I, I, don't, I may not understand it, but God, I'm at your feet. I'm at your mercy, God, because whatever you tell me to do is exactly what I will do. That's trust, my friend. So to Abraham, this is what trust looked like. Abraham didn't question. He didn't argue with God. He didn't try to negotiate with God. Abraham trusted God. Abraham was 100% in, fully trusting God, even when his son Isaac asked him. And I just want you to picture this for a minute. They're, they're going and they, they've got the sticks and he's got the knife and he's got the wood and the, the stuff that he needs to, to build the, off, the altar. And, and Isaac looks and says, Daddy, I see that you've got the sticks. I see that you've got the wood. You, you, you've got everything that we need to offer up a sacrifice to God. But, but Daddy, where is the offering? Where is the lamb? Could you imagine if your child just said, Daddy, Mother, where, where is the lamb? I see that you've got everything. But even at that point, some of us would have said, okay, my trust is done. I can't do this because, God, you gave me this son, and surely I heard wrong. Surely I, everybody is judging me for doing what you told me to do. Everybody back at the tent, I'm sure by now, is trying to figure out, why in the world God would never lead you to do that? You're just being rebellious. No, 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 no. Abraham didn't say that. What Abraham said is, God, I trust you fully. And when Isaac looked at him, Abraham's trust in God was able to look back at his blue-eyed, blonde-haired son. That's just my imagination of him. And he said these words, son, God will provide. God will. He didn't try to explain it to him because honestly, I'm sure Abraham was just saying, God, whatever the provision is, if it is even Isaac as you have spoke to me, God, I'm going through with this. God, I trust you with everything that I am. And we find that the story goes on to say that Abraham goes up to the mountain. He continues to build the altar. He even placed Isaac bound on the altar. And the word of God says that he drew back his knife when the angel of the Lord spoke. And from the bush, God provided the ram for a burnt offering. God spoke to Abraham and he said to him, and this is what I want you to get, because you have trusted, what are we talking about? God, I'm seeking you, and now I'm trusting you. Abraham, because you have trusted me, because you have done exactly as I have directed you to do, even though it was hard for the flesh, even though your friend said you were crazy, even though the church down the road had an opinion all of their own, God, you, Abraham, you trusted me. And God said to Abraham, because you trusted me. 
Because you have trusted me and done exactly as I have told you to do. Because you didn't lean to your own understanding of the way you thought it should be played out. You trusted and obeyed me. And because of that, God said to Abraham, Blessing, I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven, the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In other words, your enemies is done. Why? Because you trusted me. Because you took a step of faith and went against the grain of what the normal thing to do was. Because you said, God, you gave me direction and now I trust you. Abraham, was tr his trust looked like a wholehearted trust. He was all in. But let's look at someone else in the New Testament. How did the, the woman at the, not the woman at the well, but how did the trust look to the woman that had the issue of blood? That had been bleeding for 12 years. No doubt she had been probably quarantined in her home for quite some time because she couldn't go out. She couldn't figure out, you know, how much, I, I know she was barren. Because come on, women. I mean, I don't, I'm not going to give a biological lesson here. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think you want me to go there. But the fact is, is that this woman said, I'm leaving my home and I'm going to where I heard that Jesus was. Now, she didn't, there's no record that she knew Jesus, right? She just went to where she heard that he was and she said these words. If I can just touch the hem of his garment, I know, I trust, I know because I trust that I will be made whole. She trusted the miracle working power of Jesus all the way to the point that she didn't have to have his full attention. She didn't have to have the preacher laying hands on her. She didn't have to have the anointing oil. She didn't have to have nobody slapping her around. She didn't have to fall out in the spirit. She didn't, all she had to do is say, God, if Jesus, if I could just touch the tassel of your robe, then my trust is that I'll be made whole. She had a desire to see Jesus so bad that when she arrived and the crowds were all gathered around, she pushed her way through the crowds, is what the word tells. She made her way, excuse me, sir, excuse me, I, I, don't, I don't want to get in your way, I'm so sorry, I just want to touch the tassel. I, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to get in, I'm not trying to skip in line in front of you. I, I don't want to talk to Jesus, he don't have to touch me, I just want to reach out and touch the tassel. I just want to reach out and touch the hem of his garment. Why? Because she knew she had the trust and the faith that when she touched him, she would be made whole. Then we see a man, another man in the New Testament. What did trust look like to Zacchaeus? Because Zacchaeus was in a whole different ball field here. Zacchaeus wasn't Abraham. The, the father of faith. He wasn't the woman with the issue of blood that, that needed healing. He was a sinner. He was a sinner. He didn't know Jesus. He just wanted to see him. He didn't want to touch him, did he? And what the Word of God says that Zacchaeus trusted that if he could get there, he could just get a glimpse of Jesus. Not saved. Didn't have a real reason to trust him at this point. The crowds were all gathered around. And the Bible tells us, and we know from children's church, he was a wee little man. And so this wee little man decided, I can't see over the crowds. And his desire was just to see Jesus. Not to touch him, not to trust him. He just wanted to see Jesus. So the word tells us that he climbed up in a sycamore tree. Because he wanted to see Jesus. Can I stop for a minute? Because this is not in my notes. But can I stop for a minute and tell you that the purpose of that sycamore tree being planted hundreds of years before was being fulfilled in that one wee little man that had need of a, a place to climb so that he could just get a glimpse of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? There's a purpose for everything. So he had the desire to see Jesus and and he climbed up in the sycamore tree. He didn't want anything from him. He wasn't seeking healing or, or an answer for anything per se. He didn't need wealth or finances. It, the word never says that his children were off somewhere and he couldn't find. Nothing. He just wanted to see him. Yet, 
when Jesus approached the area, the word of God says that he looked up in the tree. Now, it never said Zacchaeus was calling out, hey, Jesus, uh, how about looking up this way? How about talking to him? It never says that. The word of God says that Jesus approached the tree and he looked up at him and called him by name. He called him Zacchaeus. He trusted Jesus at that moment with all he had. And he came down from the tree and allowed Jesus to go to his house for dinner. A man that he had no reason to trust at this point. An unsaved man still at this point. And can I pause long enough to tell you self-righteous religious Christians that Jesus went to his house before he saved him? That he sat at his table and ate dinner with a whole family? And then the word of God says that Zacchaeus' entire household was saved. So what did trust look like in that circumstance? Very different than it did for Abraham. Very different than it did for the woman with the issue of blood. God is looking for someone today in 2020. It, it, it's, it's ironic, maybe that's the right word, I'm not sure. But that we started out our year here at the chapel. And we all had our t-shirts and, you know, 2020 vision. God was given the, the year of double digits, the year that, that God was going to give us vision about where to go. But yet the first big trial that comes along, we don't want to take the time to see what he's doing. We're trying to lean to our own understanding. We're trying to figure it out ourselves. We're wiping the shelves clean. And I know that it's wisdom to do, you know, don't, don't. Even tell me all of that stuff. I know all of that stuff. But the fact of the matter is this. Do we trust him or do we not? That's what it goes down to. God is looking for someone, anyone, in the midst of this crisis, in the midst of this storm, to seek direction from him and then to trust him enough to follow the direction that he gives. We can lean unto our own understanding of what we think we hear or the reports that we're hearing, but we must trust God with everything that is in us if we're going to get through this thing. That He has got this thing under control. He was not taken off by surprise or off guard by this. You may have been. It may be something for you. But for him, it's just another day because the impossible can be worked through the miracle working power of the Lord. We must trust what thus says the word of the Lord. Whose report will you believe? We've said that for years in the church. We've sang songs about it. Whose report will you believe? I will believe the report of the Lord. Do you know what the report of the Lord says? The report of the Lord says that you are healed. The report of the Lord says that you are free. The report of the Lord says that if you will trust Him, even if it doesn't turn out the way you think it should, you trust Him that His plan is fulfilled in your life. That's the report of the Lord. I will still trust Him even when I don't understand His ways. When things don't turn out the way that I think they should, I will still trust him. Job 13 and 15 says this, and we know the story of Job. I'm not going to go through that. But Job stripped away of everything. And what does Job say in Job 13 and 15? Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Somebody out there uh, on live stream needs to say that in your home exactly right where you're at now. You need to stand up and you need to say, regardless of what the situation looks like, regardless if I have a place to clock in, regardless if I have a place to lay my head, regardless if I'm able to worship with my church family inside a building or not, I will trust Him. Because He has it all under control. So in closing, I want to encourage you because I know that God gave me this word for encouragement. When he first spoke it to me, I went to a couple of people that, that is in my inner circle. And I shared with them that I was going to be going live on Facebook to our wonderfully made ladies. Because I, I felt like that was a word. This was a word he gave me for them. And, and you guys, if you know me at all, you know I don't like pictures. I don't like videos. I don't even like doing this. But I'm here. Because this is the direction that God gave me and I'm trusting Him that it's all going to be okay at the end of the day. But then when Pastor asked me to bring, the, bring a word tonight, the Lord spoke to me and said, The word I gave you is bigger than just your wonderfully made ladies. There's some men out there 
that need to know God's got your back. You are providers and you are priests for your homes and you're trying to figure out. I had a man tell me this week, I don't even know if I made the right decision to keep my family in. I, I, I don't know if it was right or it was wrong. Can I tell you that's how we all are right now? We are walking aimlessly because we don't know. Don't lean into your own understanding. Men, be encouraged that God has ordained you to be priests in his house and to be priest over your house. And if you will seek him, he will give you direction for your family in this time. So I want to encourage you during this time of uncertainty. Don't get caught up in social media. Don't get caught up in the frenzy that's out there. Don't allow this to be a distraction from what God has called you to do. If you are more busy reading about what's going on in the world today than you are reading the solution, you are caught up in the frenzy of what's going on. And you don't even realize it. We don't even realize it. So I want to challenge you to exercise 2 Corinthians 10 and 5. This is what it says. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it and bring it in line with the obedience to Christ. So I want to challenge you to don't find yourself in a position where after all of this is over and done with, you're struggling with depression and anxiety and PTSD and you've got to find a place of freedom and the virus is already gone and you're still suffering from the effects of it. I challenge you to take your thoughts into captivity today. To let this be the start of a new way you view what's going on in the world. Still use wisdom. Do a sound mind. God says that and do it. But don't allow everything else to override what the Word of God says. Speak the Word of God. When you're outside in your yards, if you go outside, walk and speak the Word of God. Speak it over your life. Prophesy it over your atmosphere. No plague will come nigh my dwelling. I have a hedge of protection around me and my family, and I'm believing it, and I'm claiming that God, even if it doesn't turn out the way I think it should, I still trust you. Take your thoughts captive. Cast down imaginations. The what ifs and the terror of the moment. Let it go. Let it go. I challenge you to let it go. Lay it at the foot of the cross and leave it there. I want to close with this. I want to pray for everyone that's been a part of this live stream tonight. Everybody that, that has taken your time, thank you for taking your time and trusting me to pour into you in your homes tonight. But I want to pray a prayer before I close and in closing that God would come into your circumstance. I need him to come into our circumstance. I need him in my home every day. We walk the perimeter of our house and we say in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we are covered by the blood. In the name of Jesus, no harm, no sickness is going to enter 712 McDonough Road. It's just not going to. Because in the name of Jesus, I am covered. And I want to pray that over your families tonight. I want to pray that over every person. If you feel led, then... then Cut all the devices off other than your phone or whatever you're watching me through and stand to your feet at this time. Lift your hands in the air. Don't be ashamed to worship God right where you're at. We've all said that, that this is church a different way. So do church. Do church. Do church. Stand up and agree with me and bind with me where two or more are gathered together in my name. I will be in the midst. So I challenge you right now. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I speak over every person. Lord, I speak over, first of all, my staff that have been committed to come here tonight to make sure this live stream was broadcast. Lord, I speak over their homes and their children and their families. Lord, I speak over their jobs, God, that you would uh, keep everything in the plan as you have outlined it. Lord, I speak over their finances, Lord, that tonight 
that you would multiply their money, that you would multiply even that little bit that they may only have a little, but that you would multiply it, cause it to go to be able to cover everything that they have need of. Lord, I pray a hedge of protection around every person that has listened to this live stream and that will listen to it on the replay. Lord, I speak into the homes tonight. I speak a word of deliverance. I declare that in the name of Jesus, that, that anything we lay our hands to is going to prosper. That jobs are going to begin to open up where we thought they were not jobs and where they are needed. That your healing touch and your healing hand is going to go into every home of every person tonight. And God, that the blood is going to cover everything that we have need of. And Lord, the symptoms that may be there that cause us to wonder what if, I speak against them in the name of Jesus. Lord, I speak into every church that is represented on Facebook. Every church that is going to go live Sunday morning, God, I speak that you would give them a tremendous outpouring of anointing and that every person that tunes in to their live stream, that God, you would manifest yourself in the homes all across America. Lord, I speak that when this pandemic is done, that every house of God that has been ordained for corporate worship would be full in the name of Jesus. I speak and I lay claim to that Tonight, in Jesus' name, amen.